Hey guys, um, this is our very last lecture, sort of, um, at 3 on Wednesday, I'll be on Zoom, and we can talk about exam things, but, um, this is the last time we're just gonna have to sit and watch something for an hour, but I think you're really gonna enjoy this, I've really enjoyed it, um, Basically, I've asked some of my mentors and friends in the industry to tell you about what they do, whether that's uh, running a studio or making microphones or, um, you know, working for an audio company, uh, trying to kind of just give you an idea of, you know, if you're really thinking about this or, um, you know, you want to go into audio or music in some form and you're just not quite sure what that's going to look like for you yet. I just wanted to give you some examples of some people at different stages in their careers um, who are doing different things that maybe might give you an idea of what you want to do. Um, so, uh, to kick things off, I am going to tell you a little bit about how I ended up teaching you guys. <laughs> um, so... I know you guys know a little bit about my background and some of it's definitely like come out in some of these guest lectures where we've been talking to, you know, my former professors and bosses and um, friends, but I also just kind of wanted to tell you how I got the experience I have um, at this point in my life. So <clears throat> as you guys I think all know at this point, I went to, actually I'm going to start pre-college because uh, we're going to talk here from my very first mentor today, David Cragen, who um, I went to a boarding school in high school and there was a small studio for the music students basically to record their tapes and stuff because we had um, requirements and people had auditions and all of those things. Most of you guys are music people, you know exactly what that process is like. Um, so the studio was open to students, um, but then there was always trying, they always tried to have a couple students who were in charge of it, and halfway through my first year there, I took over, and I was working with Cragen, um, once a week, he was in Santa Fe, and we were in a small town called Montezuma, New Mexico, um, and he'd come down and basically start teaching me, like, this is how you use logic. Um, this is what a compressor is. This is what a patch bay is. Um, and I still really had no idea what I was doing, and I was like, oh, I kind of think I want to go into this recording stuff, but I didn't know what that really meant. Um, and But I got a lot of time just to like sit in a room that was relatively nice um, with logic and some microphones and a bunch of musicians at my disposal, because uh, everyone needed or wanted to be recorded, and so I just got to record everyone, um, and s very slowly start to learn what it was all about. Um, so then I went to the University of Michigan, where I double majored in sound engineering and electrical engineering, uh, and you'll hear from uh, my friend Adam today, who is going to talk about how um, his electronics knowledge really helped him get his recording career off the ground, so if any of you guys are more technically inclined, that's always kind of a good sign of, side of yourself to indulge um, if you are trying to get into the industry, because there's a lot of um, more technical jobs out there that can also then lead to having more creative possibilities. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I double majored and um, the biggest thing for me that really led to all of the opportunities I've had since college, um, so I've I've been out of college three years now, um, and it's been kind of a wild ride for me. But um, the biggest thing for me was trying to build up a base of knowledge and skills and resume builders while I was in college. So I worked at the studios that were on campus. Um, so if you intern with me if you're doing the recording certificate. I am really trying to model that off of um, the experience that I had where we were recording a lot of faculty. Uh, we were in charge of maintaining the gear so if something broke we had to learn how to fix it. Um, or sometimes you know if we couldn't fix it we had to send it off but there was a lot of soldering involved. Um, but we did a lot of big recording projects and um, just of all different genres across the from the music school and the university as a whole 
um, and we were given a lot of freedom, um, but also had a lot of oversight, so it was a really nice balance to try and learn who we were as engineers in addition to having some really good uh, feedback. Um, and then while I was doing that, I was also spent about a year interning with Jeff Michael at Big, Size, Big Sky Studios. If that name sounds familiar, it's because Lindsay was talking about him in our guest lecture. Um, and yeah, so he now runs a studio in Ann Arbor and does one of his big things is um, this series called Acoustic Cafe where bands who generally like touring bands will come through and record uh, an interview and then a live in studio session and these are broadcast on like a hundred different radio um, radio networks I don't know what the word is um, across the country so I got to work with uh, actually you'll hear from Evan Clay Paragon today he's touring with a band called the accidentals I got to record them um, the biggest act that I did for for um, you know, when I was working under Jeff was, we got to work with Casey Musgraves. So we got to do some pretty cool stuff. Um, and so I had a decent amount of studio experience coming out of college, but decided uh, I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to do the studio route. Um, Cause it is kind of, it can be very grueling. Um, and I was just not sure I was built for it. Um, so I decided to apply for and got a job with Sure Microphones, and uh, Soren will talk a little bit more about the products that I worked on there, but I was working as a DSP engineer, um, so basically digital signal processing. So I was writing software that would run on these microphones that would do things like EQ and compression and stuff like that. I'd write the EQ block, um, and then I would also sometimes tune it. So, you know, if you're using one of those mode of mics that Soren will tell you about, there's like a guitar setting and a speech setting. Um, so what I would do is I would write something, I would tune it to a setting that sounded good. I would go talk to Adam, who works in the studio at Sure, and you'll hear from him today. And we would set up a session and we would record some guitar, um, and we would record some speech and we would record it with these different settings and different tweaks on the microphone um, processing that I had written. And then we'd go so show it to Soren and he'd say, I like this, I don't like this, this sounds good, this doesn't sound good. So it was kind of this, um, a lot of really technical work up front where I was coding a lot, um, but then on the back end it was kind of this sound engineering type work where I was trying to really figure out what sounded good. Um, so I was working there, and through a pretty crazy series of events, uh, I ended up meeting um, Justin from Bon Iver, and um, he invited me to come help them prepare. He hired me on as a production assistant, which is um, still my position with them, and uh, invited me to come up to Eau Claire last August to help them prepare for tour and just do some kind of various techie things that they just don't have the bandwidth to do themselves. Um, and when I was up here, A, I really fell in love with Eau Claire, and B, I met some people from the university and the Pablo and heard about the certificate program. And obviously you guys know what I do now, it's teach you. Um, and I will say I had no idea um, when I was in college that I was ever going to be an audio educator. Um, I did TA classes, I did teach a little bit, I gave a lot of workshops um, as part of working at the studios to train students how to use the studios because they were open to anyone. Um, so I had to think a little bit of a background in education and really enjoyed it and just never really thought that I would be an audio educator. Uh, and you'll hear that that's kind of the theme of the day of um, a lot of people in audio jobs. Things don't go the way that they expect, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Um, there's a lot of turns if you're trying to become an audio engineer of any sort or work in this industry. It's going to be different than you expect, but um, 
I think uh, Soren says in his video, if you keep working, um, if you just keep working at it, you're going to find your place, which I think is really, really good advice. All right, uh, before I turn this over to a couple of these folks, I also wanted to show you guys my home setup um, because I know we're all working from home and I know a lot of people have been asking me about, you know, what kind of stuff that I use, what kind of stuff I recommend. All right, guys, so here is kind of the guts of my setup and I know it's dark in here and difficult to see. I got a Mac Pro. And then my computer is actually sitting on top of, or my monitor is sitting on top of my interface, which is a Focusrite Claret, which is a really old model of the Focusrite um, interfaces. It's actually Thunderbolt, and I have to use kind of a janky adapter. Um, but it works for me still, uh, and I got it really cheap. So <laughs> that was the benefits there. I still really recommend the Scarlets, which I do have a um, the Focusrite uh, Scarlet Solo. Uh, this is like my little go bag of pocket synths and uh, adapters so I can, I generally have like my, um, uh, I got a Shure MV88 in here um, and then some cables so I can like hook up my guitar if I'm traveling, um, can still be working. I got M-Audio BX8s for my main speakers. Uh, I use my headphones a lot too. I have AKG Q701s, um, which I absolutely love. Um, I got, this is like the only synth I will ever need personally, um, uh, the OP1, I just love it, it's a synth sampler, everything, um, I ha I do have a MIDI keyboard, um, this is my little pedal shelf, um, and then some of my instruments, I always like to show off, this is a 1916 Gibson mandolin, I got uh, various, uh, that's a guitar I made, and then I have a Takamini acoustic, a banjo, a Schecter, that was my very first guitar, a little Fender acoustic I keep in Nashville tuning. For me, it's been really helpful to have um, guitars I keep in different tunings for composition and such. This is my messy little pedal board right now, uh, and my wall of amps, um, and my telly that I've been playing mostly. Uh, so you can see it's a pretty simple setup. The only treatment I have in my room are these like foam panels. So this is right behind this. So basically all I'm trying to do is minimize the reflections in my room. Um, I also have all these flag decor, which kills a lot of reflections too. But uh, this is kind of a weird size shaped room. So it actually sounds pretty good for a little room in my apartment. Um, yeah, so it's time now for you guys to listen to someone other than me talk, but I wanted to show you my setup too, and let me know if you have any questions. Hi, I'm Dave Perlman of Perlman Microphones in uh, Canyon Country, California. And uh, what I do is I build microphones. I have about seven different models right now. I try to keep them priced kind of low so that a normal person can afford them. You're not going to break the bank by buying my mics. I originally started uh, this enterprise. I ran a recording studio uh, starting in the late 70s and ran this place up until 2005 approximately. And I noticed that a lot of the clients wanted to have a lot of tube microphones at their disposal. Um, at the time, I'd been trying to do my own repairs because uh, technicians usually charge $75 to $150 an hour to do repairs on equipment. So I was trying to teach myself how to do that. And I was repairing and modifying microphones, and I realized that I could probably start building my own tube mics. And then the whole idea was just to have have tube mics in the studio as a client magnet. So I would build four or five mics that were very similar to U47, and I would book clients in. And uh, what happened was people were singing under the mics, and because they were new and didn't have the difficulties that a lot of vintage mics would have, people started asking me to sell them these mics and then maybe to build other mics for them 
And it turned out that I was making more money and spending less time working while I was building the mics than I was engineering and running a recording studio. So I started doing that full time. I closed the studio, sold all my vintage gear, and used that money to open the microphone business. And uh, so it started between 2004 and 2005 when I was experimenting. I only had the, the very first model was a TM1, which is based on a U47. And then I built a mic that was the TM2. I kept getting requests from people to build a lighter mic that was similar to the TM1. So the TM2 is essentially the same microphone with a smaller output capacitor and uh, a slightly shorter tube, but essentially the same mic. It does have a different sound because the capsule basket is a different dimension. So the volume of that capsule basket is going to affect the sound. Um, from there, I went on to emulating the MGM Stanley Church microphone, which is uh, one of Al Schmidt's favorites. He uses that a lot. I also got uh, T-Bone Burnett to record the last Elton John record with, with my uh, TM Church mic. Um, the next mic I was building, uh, which was a custom order to begin with, was the Telefunken 250. So my TM 250 is the recreation of that mic. And I try to use as original to the schematic as I can possibly get on those mics. Um, I'm also experimenting now with a, with a FET 47 type mic and a C12A type microphone. So I'm having a blast doing this. It's really, really quite fun. Um, but again, I'm trying to keep the prices down. I do almost everything in-house here in my shop. I build everything by hand. Every mic is, is hand-wired point to point. And uh, I try to keep no, I have no printed circuit boards in the microphones except for the, uh, the C12A mic and the 47 FET mic. Those have printed circuit boards, but all the rest of the stuff is point to point wired with real capacitors and res real resistors, no surface mount stuff. And uh, it's a blast. I get to work by myself. I get to do this. I enjoy it immensely. I get so much, uh, uh, I get a lot of appreciation from my clients and I get cards and letters and emails from people who are using my stuff. Anyway, it's really, really fun. And it's, it's, a, it's an extension of when I was a touring musician, too, before the studio. Uh, in the mid-70s, I toured extensively with a lot of acts, played on a lot of records, played on a lot of movie soundtracks, television shows, commercials. And then it, that morphed into uh, having the studio, where I also then worked with a lot of uh, television networks, NBC, ABC, etc., uh, I got uh, I got a couple of awards for doing things that I do, um, so it's been it's been really good. I really really enjoy it. Um, so that's pretty much how I got here, what I do, uh, and like I said, the the shop is here. There's the bench over there. I literally make all the all the connections and all the cables myself. Uh, it's, it's really a great, great uh, career for me. Like I said, I get to work by myself. I answer to no one. And it's just a lot of fun. So if you have any questions, please go to my website, email, or call me anytime. Um, I hope that's good. Thanks so much. Hey guys, my name is Evan Klee Paragon, and I'm going to talk about uh, careers in live sound and some of the different roles within that. Um, so I'm the touring live sound engineer for a band called The Accidentals. Um, I've done about 200 shows a year uh, with those guys for each year for the past three years. Um, toured all over the United States and uh, some in Canada and the UK doing theaters, clubs, uh, performing arts centers and festivals. Um, I also uh, am a house engineer at the Majestic Theater and Royal Oak Music Theater in Detroit. And I uh, have 
freelanced for a bunch of different production companies and venues and worn about every hat in the live sound world at various points over the last five years. One of the big distinctions of the breaking down uh, what direction your career can take within live sound um, is uh, working for a venue versus a production company versus an artist. Um, it's good to get experience with each. Uh, most people start out at a venue or you know, even more often like working for a production company because, you know, the guys were doing outdoor shows and, uh, you know, bringing PA and lights and video into venues that don't necessarily have that. Always need people to push boxes and wrap cables and you can learn, you know, get your hands on the console, um, you know, at, and uh, watch over somebody's shoulder until you're ready to really, uh, you know, go out there and start mixing the X as a lead person on a gig. Um... Now, if you like routine and, uh, you know, a variety of acts and really getting to know a space and know a PA, then, like, venue work is great. I personally wouldn't want to be in the same room every night, you know, four or five nights a week. But, you know, some people love that. You know, they find their niche and sit in it. Um, production company work is great because you do a variety of shows and it keeps you active. You get to work outside in the summer. On the other hand, you get to work outside in the summer, which means you get rained on, you get sunburned, uh, you know, you're sweating and moving heavy equipment. So, you know, that may or may not be a thing. Working for an artist, which is what my main gig has been for the past few years, is, I think, great as long as you love to travel because it means heavy touring. If an artist is hiring their own front of house engineer, usually they're touring a lot. Um, but it's really cool because you really get to partner with somebody and, like, help translate their artistic vision of their songs to the audience. Um, there's also, you know, not just music, live sound work, there's a lot of uh, corporate work to be done, which I haven't done as much of, but, um, you know, it's not as exciting, but there's good technical challenges to be solved, and uh, if you're good, you can make a lot of money doing that. Um, so then within... A venue or a festival situation or what have you there's gonna be like two or three different roles that a sound engineer might have um so I with the accidentals I'm mainly their front of house engineer which means I mix with the audience ears um it's a high pressure position because if you mess up you know lead vocals not unmuted when the singer steps up to it or something feeds back or what have you um everybody looks at you everybody knows you messed something up on the other hand, it's extremely creatively rewarding because, but you know, you get to know the songs working with the artist night after night, you know, dial in, oh, the delay throw goes here, or, you know, this could really benefit from this, uh, this effect, um, et cetera, et cetera, and that's cool. Um, then there's a monitor engineer who is the, uh, obviously the engineer who mixes the monitors mixes what the band hears. Um, which I think it, there's less like art, maybe artistry to it and more kind of like science and just being quick on your feet and quick to, it's about communication, communication skills really. And like being able to, uh, figure out what your artist wants and give it to them quickly. Um, and, uh, as like mid and high level productions are more and more moving from wedges to in-ear monitors, it's like. Not only do you have to be able to ring out that monitor wedge and get it really loud without feeding back, you also need to be able to do a great stereo separation in ear mix with a good soundscape that feels natural for the artist. And you often have to be a little bit of an RF tech. Um, on a bigger production, the RF tech might be their own role, but a lot of the times it's also the monitor engineer. Um, I have here this guy that I keep in my toolkit. It's an RF Explorer. Plugs into my computer, and uh, what what it does, it scans uh, the um, frequency spectrum from about you know, 400 to 600 or 800 megahertz, and it uh, um, connects to uh, some software uh, called Sure Wireless Workbench. Uh, Sennheiser also has one called Wireless Systems Manager. Um, and uh, you can use that to uh, see where there's interference in your area, and it will calculate where you can run your wireless mics, wireless in-ears, wireless guitars, etc., cetera, um, without encountering interference. Um, you might also, uh, if you're like working a mid-sized festival or something, a monitor guy or 
uh, girl may double as a patch tech. So, or the patch tech may be their own person, which would mean uh, the patch tech is responsible for uh, the patch and making sure that uh, stage, front of house, and monitor world are all on the same page as far as the input list goes. Everything ends up on the right channel. You know, you don't want, uh, you know, tuba coming out of what's supposed to be your lead vocal and, you know, kick drum coming out of your hi-hat, uh, especially if you're doing a festival where you've got, you know, 30-minute changeovers and, you know, everybody's looking at you because you're still sound checking the band was supposed to start 15 minutes ago. And so if you're, if you're the person who people trust to make sure that situation doesn't happen, um, then that makes you a really valuable member of, of uh, the team doing a show. So the last role I'm going to talk about is uh, being a system tech. So uh, system teching basically is uh, the art and science and of uh, hanging and uh, designing a PA um, such that you cover the audience area um, as evenly as possible at the desired sound level um, with uh, a, as flat and accurate of a response as possible and a minimum on one reverberation, you know, keep the sound from bouncing off the walls, focus, focus it on the audience, basically. Um, so some of the tools we use for doing that, um, other than just general, you know, knowledge of the, the physics and the theory behind acoustics and a little bit of rigging knowledge, are uh, acoustic prediction software such as uh, D&B Array Calc and Meyer Sound Map, which uh, is a really cool tool that lets you basically create a simple CAD drawing of the room that you're going to be uh, deploying your PA in, and then you can model how different, uh, you know, trim heights, different angles, different configurations of subwoofers, etc., will affect the way sound is dispersed through that area and come up with the best solution given the, given the boxes that you have access to and the area you're trying to cover. Um, and then kind of the counterpart to that, to verify your results once you've actually physically deployed the PA in the field, um, you use uh, acoustic measurement software such as Smart, 10 Easy, SpectraFoo, Fuzz Measure, etc. Um, that's Smart with two A's, um, is kind of the industry standard, um, and uh, a measurement mic such as this. And uh, what you can do with that, if you guys are familiar with uh, FFT, Fast Fourier Transform, um, basically uh, this software allows you to view the magnitude and phase response of the transfer function. In of your PA system in your room in real time. And so you'll use that to get, try and get a flat response um, out of your PA or, you know, often tilt it a little bit, a little bit warmer, more bass, less treble. Um, and also to time align different elements, uh, such as if you have a, uh, a subwoofer that's set on the ground and a top that's flown above it, the, there's a greater distance from your top to your audience than from the sub that's on the ground to the audience. System tech is kind of like a, uh, more of an engineering role um, than a creative role, but uh, there's a lot of really cool uh, problem solving involved. You know, if that's kind of the direction you end up going in, you know, you'll uh, hopefully get to build some big PAs for uh, some cool productions. Um, anyway, that's, uh, that's my time and that's my overview of uh, different roles in the live sound world. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to hit me up at uh, ekp.audio at gmail.com. Um, and uh, thanks for listening. Hi, my name is Soren Peterson. I'm a product specialist at Sure Incorporated. I uh, had the pleasure of working with Professor Lena for a while um, on a team that developed a, uh, a microphone that I'm using right now into my iPhone uh, called the MV88 Plus. So, um, she asked me to talk a little bit about uh, sort of how I got to where I was, and uh, it's been a strange journey. You know, I, w I was once myself an audio student. Uh, I went to Columbia College in Chicago. Um, I went through the sound for picture curriculum and then went back into the recording for music curriculum because I just couldn't get away from music and, um, you know, five, fifth year senior type of deal. Um, I got out of there and freelanced for a year with moderate to not great success. Um, I had more like voiceover gigs than I did, you know, but I wanted to be making records. So that was a, that was a tough period type of thing. Uh, but a, a, a real thing. Um, I had a couple of internships in my last year of senior, um, my last year, my last senior year in college, um, at an amazing recording studio in Wisconsin called Smart Studios. Uh, 
really cool post-production house, jingle house here in Chicago called Spank Studios at the time, or Spank Music, um, who did some really high-profile jingles, like the Mazda thing, and I like Mike back in the day. <clears throat> uh, that ended up, I needed a job at some point, so I, uh, I had a full-time job at Zounds.com as a customer service rep on the phone, just selling audio gear and helping people. I uh, did that for about three or four years, and... Um, uh, applied to a customer service job that was opening at Sure uh, several times actually I applied for over about an 18 month period about six or seven times uh, they finally called me and brought me in uh, and I was already doing that job on you know selling Sure gear on the phone they were like you seem like a really good fit for this I was like yeah I know that's why I've applied seven times so uh, they brought me in I was in customer service for a couple years and uh, Sure is an amazing company to grow in they are very proactive about um, especially in those entry level positions like customer service, like you don't have to be here forever, you know, put in a couple years of service. And then if you're passionate about sales or marketing or whatever, we can find you a path from there. So, um, I was pretty dead set on being an applications engineer at sure, which is like their high end tech support function. Um, after another year or two on the phone, I did not want to continue my career on the phone, helping people who don't know about audio. Um, <clears throat> so I found out about a group called product management. This was not a career that I knew existed um, before my exposure at Sure. I had met some of the team working some trade shows. I, had, I was lucky enough to go to NAM as a customer service rep uh, and just meet people. Um, and a lot of the, the product management guys and I got along right away because you know I was I was a gearhead and I had an audio background, um, a formal audio background. Um, so they brought me into the group a couple years later uh, into the Wired team, and that's where I'm on now. So I have the pleasure of working on Sure XLR microphones like the SM58 and 57 and um, the, you know, the Elvis microphone, the Model 55. That's some of the special edition stuff over my shoulder here that I got a chance to work on. Uh, these are not only like, are they industry legends? They're like pop culture icons. So it's really like, it's fun to work on something bigger than yourself. And it's just something I've never had considered before. Uh, also got the pleasure to, to be involved in sort of the ground floor of a microphone line called Motive. And that's, uh, the, the, the same family of products as where Lena and I started working together. Um, sure was observing some trends of iOS devices being really popular in practice spaces and even in like, uh, you know, digital drum sets with a little iPad slot in it and uh, a guitar with an iPad slot in it that you can go through different amp sims and stuff. Um, so Sure wanted to be a part of that. And uh, I, I helped to define a mid-side microphone um, with app integration uh, that we're still selling uh, quite a bit of today. And um, it's been a wonderful path, and what's what's what I love most about it is Sure is a company that honestly is a customer first type of thing. Um, obviously, it's a it's a business, and that's a big part of it. But they don't do anything unless there's a, a real problem that they have a real solution for, and they dedicate a lot of time to enabling people like me uh, to go out to uh, interview customers and sit with them and you know be in their shoes for a couple of days and um, and make sure that we do that representative of all different types of people all around the world and uh, just really get a sense for who our customer is and, and what their needs are. So then when we define a product, it's not just a spec sheet that we're making. It's a, it, we have real use cases in mind that we design for and test extensively for, um, you know, we see opportunities. Like there wasn't a whole lot of other uh, iPhone connected microphones um, when the MV88 came out and we were really the first one to really integrate an app as a, as a GUI. So uh, it's a mid side microphone. You can change the stereo width of the, uh, of the microphone itself in an app, and that was that was pretty pretty unique at the time, and still is, because um, I'm lucky enough to work for a company like Sure that has the resources to do that. Um, but it's really it's a it's a customer first thing. I feel like I'm making product for me ten years ago or me now. You know, uh, I would the the other best part of the gig is when we're developing things. I'm I'm usually one of the customers that we're designing for. So I'll you know I took our little iPhone microphone to band practice once a week for a year and a half while we were making it, and um, my like shitty metal band at the time got a lot of input on how you know how the microphone behaves, and uh, that's why you can take it into a, a, a rock show or a crazy stupid loud practice space. Uh, and get an awesome recording, and it, it changed the way that we practiced, you know. So it was it's cool to to know that um, to launch something like that, and then see other musicians like yourself, not like hey we're selling boxes, because um, to be clear, as a product manager, I am not incentivized to do that. I'm incentivized to solve uh, problems, and that's that's the best part. Like uh, it's like non commissioned sales. When I was at Zounds, it was very 
It's a weird thing to be put on the phone and say you're not measured by sales, but sell as much as you can. But it's like, great, I'm, I don't care then. I'm just going to get them the right things. So they measured us on stuff like uh, lowest return rates. And Anyway, so uh, there is an audio path other than just making records being the studio. I am. I beg of you, if you're in a class like Lena's, to uh, involve yourself as much as possible. Get internships, go to studios, work for free, put yourself out there, man. It, it is a, uh, a smaller community uh, around, uh, around the country than you'd think, and really around the world than you'd think. Um, build as many bridges as you can. Don't burn bridges for any reason, even if people are stupid, because, you know, people are stupid. Uh, Stay humble. That's a big thing in this industry. Uh, everybody thinks everybody else's mix sounds like shit. It's just different. Just deal with You own that now and you'll be leagues ahead of your colleagues. Um, just be in it, man. Do it all the time. Do it as much as you possibly can. Uh, I assume that you're in audio school because it's something that you love and not uh, um, like you're going to send out a bunch of resumes and a bunch of corporations are going to compete for you and you'll have job offers. Um, I, I, God, that would be awesome. I, I hope all of you have job offers out of college, but, uh, it's usually in this industry. It's a thing you got to work for. Uh, and as long as you're working, you don't have to know where you're going to end up. I didn't know that product management was a thing. I didn't know I wanted a business, a, a nine to five job. Um, but it's worked out pretty great because that enables me to have an awesome little project studio. Um, that's a pure hobby and I don't have to generate, uh, revenue you know i have to pay my bills based on it so i can when i do want to work with the band then i can just kind of turn it on and turn it off if i'm traveling for work i can't do it for a couple months or um have bands but it's it's a wonderful thing that's enabled me to do that for fun so i'm I'm making more music now than i ever have even though i have a nine to five job and it's usually more than nine to five uh it's a it's a business it's a gig you know i do spreadsheets and like boring shit like that but uh when I get to see my stuff being used by people like yourself and people loving it, it's it's a pretty addicting little thing, actually. But um, hang in there. It's tough. It takes many years uh, for, for it to kind of fall into place. I hope your path is shorter than mine. But, man, it's it's cool. I, I, I would do it over. I had a blast. I'm still having a blast. Still learning. Um, like I said, I'm making more music than ever now, even though I have an office job. And that's that's, that's what keeps the office job like great you know uh, I'm lucky enough to have a pretty cool office job but even if it's not in the audio industry um, stay in the studio keep doing what you like more power to you Hi my name is David Cragen I have a recording studio in Santa Fe New Mexico called Santa Fe Soundworks and I am going to give you a little talk on what I do, how I do it, and my philosophy and process. I'm a recording engineer and producer, and I help people make records, as well as a myriad of other jobs that I do to be able to make ends meet while I'm hoping to be able to make another record. I started playing guitar in 1968 in San Diego, California, and that led me to lots of other avenues that I've done to be able to sort of support my guitar playing addiction. I have, I think, 50 guitars or more. I have so much recording equipment and weird devices that I use for either playing guitar or recording that my tiny studio is a little insane looking, period. Oh yes, I'm not speaking into Siri, sorry. So, I would give you a long history of what I do or what I have done, but it might be a little boring. I will say that I worked in Los Angeles in some recording studios and I used to work for Danny Elfman, who is the music person for most, if not all, of the Tim Burton movies. And then I moved to Santa Fe in the early 90s, and I've had my own recording studio since 1988. And it's not easy 
to go it alone. In some respects, I feel I would be amiss if I didn't tell you to find a job at a recording studio or a live sound company or someplace that you could actually make some decent money. But my way has always been to focus on the art and create records however, by hook, by crook, and with whatever equipment that I had at the time. And I just don't know how to do it any other way. And so that's what I've done. It's because of my passion as a musician and my love of sound that that's what occurred in my life. And I have done lots of jobs that I would probably have preferred not to do, but that also expanded my knowledge and my interest in music, all while collecting and selling hundreds and hundreds of different pieces of equipment that I've used and learned from. One of the things that I would say is that there is still a world of old, cool, musical equipment out there that you can collect for fairly cheap, period. Oh, there it is. I'm not talking to Siri, period, comma, exclamation point, quote, unquote, etc. So keep your eye out for cool old tube stuff. Even if it doesn't work, you can probably get it fixed. And it's interesting to be able to experiment with, and it makes cool sounds that you won't be able to get from music store equipment. Old professional audio equipment from back in the day is getting more and more expensive. But if you rummage around and look in odd places for it, you can find extremely cool stuff. There's a series that I recommend on YouTube called Show Me Your Junk, I think. Earthquaker Devices. Anyway, lots of old weirdos like me will show you their junk. No, not like that. Their actual junk. Anyhow, so my process is that lots of times I will start with a singer-songwriter and I make a fancy click using a drum machine in Logic Pro. And then we put together a scratch track of guitar and vocal or keyboard and vocal or whatever that is. And then we start dressing it up with overdubs. I also love to record bands live, but that's a much bigger process. Miking a whole drum kit, having a headphone mix for the bass player, the guitar player, the singer, keyboard player, whatever it is and then recording all of that at once requires a certain amount of space, a certain amount of gear, a certain number of microphones, and a certain knowledge set. Because when you're recording everything all at once, that's sort of what you get in the end. Now you can overdub, you can fix things, etc., but it's not easy. It used to be that that was the only way that you could do it, and it's exhilarating and there's a certain level of performance that happens when you do that that is unmatched when you're doing what I call the layer cake method of recording. But I like doing both. I can do both in my relatively small studio. But something else I will talk about is space, the final frontier. Having your own space as a recording studio owner is very important. Having a little place in your bedroom that doesn't include the dog barking, your kid sister complaining to your mother, the noise of the air conditioner or the refrigerator, and you not bothering other people is fairly intense. If you're a drummer, forget it. If you like to play electric guitar loud, forget it. You have to have your own space. And there are lots of ways to get around that but there's nothing like being able to make as much noise as you want and be able to record that and be able to do like I'm doing now with this voiceover and not have a truck go by and ruin a take. So that's a big ask for an individual. That's why recording studios exist. They spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on their facility to create a place that's going to be sonically pleasing inside where noise doesn't get out and noise doesn't come in. It's only what you want to record when you want to record it 
that enters your microphones. There are lots of ways to get around it. If you record synthesizers, normally you don't need a microphone and drum machines and that sort of thing, but it's something to think about. The last thing I'll talk about is flow. And that's part of art for me. Art for me is where the gold is as far as being a recording engineer, producer, slash musician. If I feel like I'm doing art, then normally I can shut my brain off for a little while, stop thinking about the past, stop thinking about the future, and just be in it, in that moment. And even if you never have a career recording, producing, or even as a musician, being able to do that, being able to have that feat happen in your life is a big deal because life isn't easy and life for the most part isn't that fun a lot of times. So being able to have that little flame flickering somewhere in your life to where you can shut everything else out, shut everything else off, and just go deep into your art, even if it's just for a few minutes a day, it changes you, makes you more authentic, and gives you a real experience that I think is hard to find any other way. Even if you're an auto mechanic, it's still art if you can go into that flow, if you can be there and really be there deep inside. It makes it all worth it. I've worked at this harder than anything else I've ever worked on in my entire life. Digging ditches seems easy by comparison in many respects. It's a different kind of work, but over the last 50 years, I have put all of my blood, sweat, tears, and joy, exhilaration. You can turn a crappy situation into gold, and I can't recommend it enough, but you have to really go for it. Um, my name is Peter. Uh, I know Lena because she is a very dear friend of mine from undergrad. But, uh, but me, um, I am broadly a podcast audio engineer. Um, so I mix podcasts. Um, and that encompasses, um, like audio engineering, uh, sound design. Um, I make a lot of music for the shows that I work on. Um, as well uh but i'll get into that um yeah so i uh i work for gimlet media which um is a subsidiary of spotify spotify studios um now uh i mix sound design compose for a show called science versus right now um that's been my baby um and uh, I'm part of a team of, I think it's 13 audio engineers at Gimlet and all of us are musicians. Pretty much everybody is, I think, um, is a musician. Um, and you know, before they were a podcast audio engineer, they wanted to make records. Um, uh, but then, you know, somehow just like the rest of us kind of stumbled into podcasting as like a good application of creativity and audio engineering. Um, and I really like, um, I really, really love my role so far at, at Gimlet. It's like a great balance of technical and creative. Um, before I go into that, uh, before I go into that, I'm just going to talk about where I come in, in like the process of a podcast episode. So like a show team, um, does all of the pre-production and production by themselves, which means that they, you know, Gimlet has an array of self-operated studios that they can go into and record, or in the case of, you know, during a pandemic, they have their all, they all have their own home setups, um, to, so each host will record themselves for any, you know, host narration that they're doing, um, they'll conduct interviews, um, they'll, you know, go out in the field and, and, and gather tape, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever sounds they want to have in their show. Um, and maybe, uh, 
Maybe they will go on assignment to some place and record on scene for a really long time, or maybe it's, yeah, whatever, whatever is necessary. So the, sh the team of people that's responsible for that show will, will assemble all of that tape into like roughly the bones of a, com a narratively complete episode. And then I come in kind of like as one of the later stages of the post-production process. So I get, um, if I were to equate it to like music production, it's like, I get the, I get the song when it's, you know, like 85% written and like al almost, almost all the, well, you know, maybe like 75% of the instruments are tracked, but nothing's been mixed yet. Um, yeah, that's where I come in. I, the technical parts of my job at this point in the process is like, I make, I, I have to restore, um, correct and uh, like address any things in the tape that might the, in the audio that I'm getting that um that need attention um so and, and I need to correct everything um for loudness like through applying a couple stages of hopefully really transparent compression um our loudness target at uh Gimlet and Spotify is negative 16 loofs um and we like to have a loudness range of like four to eight loudness units this is getting a little in the weeds but you know what we're here whatever um and uh and yeah usually um we get to that target by like by doing a combination of um uh of compression but also some like kind of hand leveling um with clip gain uh so yeah, there's like, um, Gimlet has tried to be really intentional about having a sound of our shows where we don't have like really, really, really compressed voices all the time, just because that sounds kind of like garbage. But I digress. Um, so that's, a, that's the technical part of my job. Um, you know, applying any amount of like doing a lot of denoise, dereverb, um, and corrective EQing, um, and yeah, Isotope is like, just goes, is so very heavily used <laughs> in my, in my, um, line of work when we get bad tape. But, um, other than making the whole entire show, all the dialogue that's in the show sound, you know, um, within a tight loudness, um, range and not distractingly bad at any point during the show. Um, the other part of parts of my job are pretty creative. So, you know, if the show team has a vision that they want this part of their episode to sound like it's in like a 1940s London bus station, then I'm the one that's responsible for realizing that, that world. Like I will, um, sound design in many layers, like what it would, what all the things that you might hear in, um, in a bus station back then, if they really want to immerse, um, if they really want to have the listener immersed in that, um, I'm kind of responsible for like making the, the story come to life. And I make a lot of, I make a lot of music of the music for science verses and my entire team makes pretty much, I would say like 75% of the music that ends up in Gimlet shows is all original music that we make. That might be that might be my favorite part of the job is composing, um, is composing podcast music. It's a different animal than composing, you know, music personally. Just because the music that I have to that I compose for podcasts can't be the star of the show, so you have to compose in like a really certain way that make, makes it so that what's really supposed to shine, you know, all the dialogue in the show still can, but the emotions of whatever is going on in the story at the point that you're scoring are like teased out by your compositions. They're not like distracting or overwrought or anything. So it's kind of, it's, it's a tough balance to strike. It's a very specific animal composing for podcasts. Um, so yeah, I, I like a lot of my day to day, um, when I'm not like actively mixing a show is sometimes I'll just like take two hours out of the middle of a day and just be like, I feel like writing, trying to write some scoring. Let's, and then, you know, I'll, um, pull in some sample dialogue to whatever my like logic session is. I compose in logic. I really like, I 
I, I feel like, um, I feel like since I, since it was my first DAW, I just will always love Logic. But anyway, um, I'll like drag in some sample lot, some sample dialogue and kind of like try and compose around that. Uh, and that, you know, that works or sometimes I'll get done with that two hours and I'll be like, fuck, this cue sucks. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, so, uh, probably I, I kind of started to get out a bit of what like my favorite part of the job is. It definitely is a lot of the creative aspects and being able to help like realize the creative vision that the producers and the hosts of the show have. If they're like, we really want the show to have this sound like this, this, you know, this show is about like Satanism in the eighties. Like we want maybe some of the scoring to have like a metal twinge, but you know, still be true to the topic. Then, you know, hearing that, like me and the, the, uh, the team of people that we, that work with, like, we'd be like, yeah, like, like, let's help. Let's see if we can help you realize that. Um, and I love, even though sound designing, like layers of a scene, um, is very time intensive and is, is like really detailed work. Um, uh, I really love that part of my job too. Um, and just to give you an example of like sometime, one time that I did that, um, Science Versus did an episode about, um, when, uh, President James Garfield was, um, assassinated and they wanted to, um, they wanted to like take the listener through that day in the train station where he was assassinated. And so I like made, sh I, I like, um, I, you kind of like follow as the listener you like follow your way like through a bunch of horse carriages like through the big wooden doors of the train station then you hear like all the people in the train station and then like you hear the gunshot and then you hear people start to yell and then like really hurried footsteps and then like panic start to ensue in the in the train station and like I I when I was finding little train noises to uh, to put in there. I was like, I, I can't have anything that sounds like it's a modern train. Like these all have to sound like trains that are actually from the period. So yeah, that was, it was very, it's really time intensive and, um, and tiring, but like it's, it, that stuff is really fun. Um, but I would say some of my least favorite parts of the job are, um, uh, that, I think that like pretty much all of us as audio engineers are responsible for realizing somebody's vision. And in order to do that, you have to work with them in such a way that they're going to give you the resources that you need. Like if you're recording, um, a, if you're recording, um, a band's song, you need them to play well in order for you to mix well, you need them to be able to write their parts well enough in some cases, you might need them to get you materials, like if they're at home tracking themselves and then sending them uh, those files to you, you need them to get them to you on a timely basis. And I kind I run into all the same things um, where if I get, you know, I can't polish a turd. It's it's like I need um, good materials from people who want me to realize their 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 vision. So a lot of what I the parts of my job that I don't like are waiting for people to get me things um, and kind of trying, having to resurrect things that I get, pieces of audio that I get um, or really bad tape or, or, or a bad story or whatever, trying to, to, to do whatever I can to rectify it like in post-production. And that's, um, just to see if you, you know, I can save the, save at least some of the quality of the episode. That's, that always really sucks. Um, yeah. And I think that, you know, you guys can relate. Um, I think that that pretty much covers a lot of it. I'm at my sister's house during this whole pandemic. She's graciously allowed me to. And so I have like my, um, in, I, I'm, I work out of the library and I have like this little corner where all my guitars and like my MIDI keyboard and 
everything are just like piled onto that little desk there. And I have like, I just sit there like day in and day out nowadays and just, I'm either like cranking away on trying to finish mixing um, an episode of Science Versus or I'm trying to write music either for Science Versus or some other new show that Gimlet has coming out. Um, but yeah. Uh, that's a little bit about, that's a little bit about my job. Hope you guys like. Hi, my name is Adam Beck. I'm making this video for Lena Sutter's uh, audio class. Um, I am uh, a freelance engineer and sure microphones recording engineer based out of Chicago, Illinois. Um, I grew up around here and then I did go to school for audio. So I've graduated from Indiana University in Bloomington um, from their department that at the time was called Recording Arts. I know that's changed now, but I don't recall what to. Um, then when I graduated from there, I started doing any sort of freelance audio work I could get my hands on, um, a lot of which ended up being repair work. Um, so I had a gig at a studio, but I got into that studio because I was able to work on their API. And then I had a live sound gig, but I got that live sound gig because I was repairing power amplifiers for them. Um, so that has sort of been the undertone of my, of my career. I've had uh, a fair bit of success with recording, but um, I've sort of walked in the back door through all of those um, with electronics experience. Um, so at some point I moved back to Chicago and I started working for sure repairing wireless units. So again, there's the theme. Um, and then when a position opened up in the recording studio, I moved over there. So the studio at Sure is not a traditional studio and it dovetails my recording experience with my technical experience pretty well because we largely don't spend time recording artists. We're working on product validation and testing both objective and subjective. And it can be as much as, you know, like, uh, does this microphone make noise in a way that's pleasing to, uh, we can get pretty deep with testing things like Codex and, you know, Lena can tell you a little bit more about what we did there. Um, but it does lend to some, some interesting artistic recordings. I got to um, record uh, some throat singers uh, at the end of last year. Um, we've done some interesting collaborations with, with modern classical ensembles recently. Um, it's also an interesting exercise in recording only with one brand's microphones. That isn't something that happens very often in the real world. Um, outside of Sure, I co-owned another studio uh, called Type One. Uh, with some friends of mine and we work on our own records and we work on you know it is a rentable studio so and that has been increasing with time as we've been successful in making more records um, and that's been an interesting thing there's a lot of fun to that especially right now during the quarantine it's been wonderful to have that but um, it's kind of a hard thing running your own studio with you you're responsible for every little bit of it if a client makes a mess that's your job if you know, the, I just had to fix our monitor controller because the left channel output chip died. Um, so I'm bringing that up because I wanted to, to bring this all back to electronics where um, I think the biggest piece of advice that I would hand to current students in audio is that you just have to be well-versed in everything. And where I was maybe looking into electronics, I think that a lot of the future of, of audio will be in networking, and I don't necessarily mean that you need to be working in, in conferencing or in corporate audio, but that, you know, there are there will be, there probably already are studios that are Dante networked, and that's the complete in and out of their studio because it's more convenient and it's way, 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 way easier than running, you know, large amounts of copper lines. It's just the wave of the future. So, you know, if you're going to arm yourself with some knowledge, maybe look for, for networking. Although, again, I think repair is a great thing. And all of that relates back to the fact that, um, there are jobs in audio. There are lots of jobs in audio. Anyone who tells you otherwise is is gatekeeping. But the reality is that there aren't a lot of large studio jobs anymore because the music industry has shifted. And I imagine that what's going on right now will will shift that even further. Um, so you just can't be stubborn. A professor of mine, his favorite line was an engineer who only works on projects they like doesn't eat. And I've certainly found that to be true. I've, done a lot of work that I didn't want to do, but I've also had a successful career in audio. You know, I'm able to pay my taxes and pay my rent on audio work. Um, so you have to be willing to look at it as a job and an artistic endeavor. Um, and that's a strange thing. It's a bizarre thing to make peace with, but 
um, if you're able to do that, you'll find that there's a rewarding and rich career ahead of you. Um, the more fun stuff, I also play drums in a couple of touring bands. Um, Intuit Over It and Sincere Engineer are the two big ones, and that has certainly led to some of the success of my personal studio. Um, yeah, I guess uh, that's about all about me. I hope you guys are all having a good quarantine.